Comics. My name is Andrew Kelly from the Bristol Festival Ideas. Very grateful to you all for coming and joining us in this festival. It's a slightly expanded festival since last year. We started actually last Monday with the first State of the City Address by Mayor George Ferguson and the debate. And then we've got sessions running through um, right through to Saturday. And I hope that I know many of you have got season tickets and we hope to see you at all those sessions. We're addressing a number of issues in this festival. Um, and one of the key ones is the first ones tonight about intergenerational economics and the jilted generation, which has been a theme we've been looking at for some time. And we've got a fantastic panel who are going to be talking about this and debating with you as part of the festival. Um, just a quick couple of announcements. This festival is being webcast live. Uh, we're very grateful for the, to the Royal Economic Society for supporting that, and we hope that all their members and others are joining in around the country, and we hope to take questions from them. Um, at the end of the session, we, some of our speakers have books, and we have a bookshop in the back, and I hope you'll take a look at some of the fantastic work that all our speakers are doing, not just in this panel, but throughout the festival as a whole. And I'd also like to thank our other sponsors and partners, Joseph Roundtree Foundation, University of Bristol, ESRC, Wiley, Princeton University Press. Um, and our panel tonight, as I said, is addressing intergenerational economics, and I'd like to introduce to our chair, Lindsay Hanley. We haven't lost our other panellists. Uh, no. <laughs> Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming um, to the inaugural event of the second Bristol Festival in Economics. Um, I don't know if anybody came last year, uh, but it was such... Uh, I was a participant in last year's um, festival, and I found it so inspiring that I asked, in fact, begged if I could come back again <laughs> and if they could find a little slot for me. Um, uh, so thank you all for coming. Uh, my name's uh, Lindsay Hanley. Um, I'm a, a freelance um, journalist uh, writing for The Guardian, and uh, we have a really, really excellent panel uh, speaking tonight on the theme of intergenerational economics and the jilted generation. Um, the title um, is taken from one of our panellists, um, Shiv Malik and Ed Hauker's book, uh, The Jilted Generation, How Britain Has Bankrupted Its Youth. So that's a very... Uh, contentious and uh, I think <laughs> brilliantly <laughs> succinct uh, way of describing what we'll be talking about tonight. Um, just a couple of sort of housekeeping notes really. Uh, the uh, festival, uh, the whole festival is being webcast um, so at some point you might be able to see yourself on the internet. Um, we're grateful to the Royal Economic Society for supporting this um, and if you're a social media user, um, if you want to comment by Twitter, the hashtag is EconomicsFest. Um, so it's my pleasure to chair this session, uh, really. Um, I, before reading Shiv and Ed's book, I was a bit on the fence, actually, um, about the whole question of whether uh, the gap between uh, the generations has be, has become more concentrated and more stark in the last 30 years. Um, and then I realised that I wasn't actually... <laughs> I realised I'm older than the generation he's talking about, unfortunately. Sorry. Just about. Um, I was born in 1976, and it was by reading um, the book, I found out that I was part of an unusually small cohort, an unusually small birth cohort. Um, the year 73-74 had... Uh, quite a miniature baby boom uh, caused um, by all accounts by the three day week and the uh, obvious consequences of blackouts and the need to keep warm um, and the years after um, uh, the years after 76 there was a, another sort of quite a big rise uh, in births that went on until the early 90s and of course we're right in the middle of another baby boom right now um, but uh, it did get me thinking in a sort of Malcolm Gladwell type of fashion that, that maybe you know uh, maybe the reason, I, the reason I managed to get a place at university and the, man, the, the reason I've managed to, um, you know, get a job in, in, you know, in a very competitive field of journalism and the media is basically because there weren't that many of us born in 1976. Anyway, um, 
the questions we're going to be uh, sort of hoping to, to deal with tonight, um, and we've got an amazing panel of speakers taken from across the generations. Um, as uh, Bonnie, uh, Bonnie Greer, one of our speakers, just said, um, she's a, a grade A baby boomer. Uh, and then we have one panellist, Owen Jones, who's under 30, the only panellist under 30, and uh, Catherine Whitehorn, um, who's a columnist for Saga. So hopefully, between the four of them... Um, and uh, nudged a little by me, who's somewhere in the middle of all of those, um, we can come up with uh, some, uh, hopefully, you know, provocative and interesting perspectives on the notion of whether there has been uh, a very damaging accumulation of wealth among the over 45s, and whether all the benefits of the post-war <coughs> settlement uh, now quite comprehensively, dis um, you know, I'm sure we'll talk about this, comprehensively dismantled, uh, have also been concentrated in the older generation at the expense of those under 35. Um, so first, I'd like to introduce um, Shiv Malik, um, who is a Gen Xer. Uh, is it, what does that mean? Does that mean somebody born around I'm 1980? I'm mysterious. Yeah, no, uh, sorry. Somebody uh, in their early 30s, I think that means. Um, Shiv Malik um, is a reporter for The Guardian and, as I say, co-author of this excellent book, so uh, I'll ask each of the um, speakers, by the way, to, to speak for a maximum of five minutes. Then we'll have a discussion between the panel and then we'll have questions from the audience. So Shiv first. Hi. Um, apologies for the delay. That was all my fault. So if you uh, think that I'm blaming you for various things, if you're in the older generation, you can blame me for holding up your evening. Um, at the end of it all, I'm not expecting an easy ride. And as you can see um, from the lights being perhaps quite bright... Um, I'm, I'm losing my hair rapidly, so I'm certainly getting older every year as it goes past. And I've been, we wrote this book about three years ago, um, and I think I lost more hair during that period than any other time, because it's never been an easy ride trying to explain this argument to any audience, especially one um, where older people are present. Um, but it is a serious debate, the intergenerational debate. And um, I think a lot of people, I'll explain a bit more about what it is in a second, but a lot of people on the left, certainly, have received this with much sort of disdain. Um, I wouldn't say they hate this argument, but they, they verge on it sometimes. Um, they don't like, strangely, for people who see the world through class, they don't like the divisions that it apparently is supposed to create between different age groups. They think that's abhorrent, um, even though, of course, class is a way of dividing the world. So is gender. Lots of things divide the world. Um, and really, we wrote this book so let me just explain why I wrote the book. And the book seeks, obviously, not to divide this, but however many times I explain this, um, people still think I'm against the old and that I must be wanting to, to murder uh, anyone over 70 or 60 uh, on sight. Yes, indeed. Boo, boo away, sir. Um, so why did we write the book? Well, it came from a very simple... Um, I wouldn't say insight, I wouldn't go as far as that. It was just kind of an observation. We were wondering why me and my co-author, Ed Hauker, and he's a bit more on the right and I'm a bit more on the left, let's put it that way, um, wondering why our lives seem to be more delayed than our parents. And what do we mean by delayed? Well, why did it take longer to sort of buy a home or why, we were, in, why were, were we in private renting for even longer than our parents? Why did it take even longer to get a job and into the world of work? And by a job, I really mean the job that my parents kind of had, uh, i.e. something that was full-time, it was salaried, it was permanent, I had some security. I only got that about, actually, I only got that job, if you want, it, in April, which is a long time, I guess one could say, from graduating from university. Um, I was married and living with loads of other people because we couldn't afford to buy a house. Now, you might say, well, that's just a London phenomenon. Well, it sort of is, but it's <coughs> also spread to other places around our country. In fact, it's spread around the world in many senses. So that's just an observation, right? That doesn't entail that it must be X and Y's fault. It's simply an observation. So we went around trying to prove this observation, and that, the result was indeed this book, which you can buy just the back. I have to say that. Um, and it's full of graphs and wonderful charts and then proving all of this really in a sense that life has got in many senses worse for the next generation. Uh, in a strange way, it's also full of passionate writing, by the way. So, you know. um, in, in a strange way, I think it proves Owen's case often and people like Owen who make the case about class, rightly so, rightly so. 
Um, I think the book sets out a mechanism in many ways for explaining why we're creating a new working class, if you want to put it that way, and we kind of do. Um, a class that, I mean, one way of defining the working class would be to say, well, okay, they don't have much security. They don't own assets. When it comes to work, they are insecure indeed. Um, they, they won't own their, they're less likely to own their home, which is obviously a big part of assets. They're less likely to have a pension. Uh, they're more likely to be impoverished uh, than perhaps before them and seriously indebted. Um, debted, obviously, debt is a form of, a sense, slavery, of, of, of uh, economic slavery, if you want. Um, so those things, I think, are truer for the next generation than they have been for this generation. And there's some very good reasons for that, which we'll come into later. I know I've only got a few um, uh, minutes. But let me just ask the audience a question. Who, at this point in the debate, maybe we'll come back to this question, um, believes that intergenerational economics, intergenerational argument is about... Its purpose is to divide generations. Who believes that that is the case, that it seeks to divide generations, or that it, or that it does? Okay, ha- hands up, hands up. Any hands up? We can take, okay, only two. So I'm, I'm going to win this debate, I think, maybe, <laughs> perhaps, if, if the level is right. Um, may, who see, uh, presumably everyone thinks the other way, that it doesn't seek to divide, in which case this is going to be an interesting debate. Um, <laughs> You don't, oh, don't know. Okay, don't knows. Who is in the don't know camp? Okay, do, does, do you think that this book and the arguments put forward like people like me, that the next generation are having it worse, um, in effect mean that the boomers have stolen their, the children's future and that they're to blame, and then it divides generations? It, does. it divides parents from their children. Is that a bit clearer? Does that make sense? Some people are still confused. Wow. Okay. Let's leave that question then and just carry on with this debate. She, she, what you're asking is something very simple. Do you think, anybody in this audience think that people in my generation, the baby boomers, have stolen their children's future? If you do, raise No, your that's hand. not the question. That's but that's, let's, let's ask that question anyway. No, well, let's ask that question. That's what the book says. Oh, sorry. No. She, she, you've only got two minutes. I've only got two minutes. Left. <laughs> okay, let's get, uh, let me just say. Um, Two very quick things, uh, which is to say, since we are here to, to talk about economics and, and the thing, I think you know, it's an argument that's been received actually quite well by economists, and I think a lot of them back up um, what we've uh, written about in terms of from an evidential basis. We've already seen some of the proof this week. I mean, it, every week there's something about this. Um, uh, the FT led with something about graduate salaries falling 12%. Um, over the last um, five years uh, during the recession. But there's loads of stuff about this, uh, and this goes across the spectrum of the age group. Um, But two serious economic questions are, one, social mobility. This book lays out and charts how social mobility, the mechanism from which um, social mobility is made worse in this country. Um, And two, it also explains how we have a more, more indebted cohort of people Student fees, mortgages, they're much higher for this generation, for, this, for this, these young adults today, than they are for the generation above. That's presumably a bad thing. I would suggest it is, and it has serious knock-on effects in terms of how do these people build their lives? How do people move out from living with their parents? How do they create families? How do they do all of this if they're under such debt and such strains? So those are the, the short points I wanted to make to start with, and uh, hopefully it will be very fun. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Shiv. For uh, kicking off the debate and uh, confusing some people. And, uh, yeah, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> sorry. Thank you also to Bonnie for clarifying the issue. Um, <laughs> next, I'd like to um, introduce Catherine Whitehorn, um, who has uh, an association with the Observer newspaper going back several decades um, and who is um, a columnist for Saga magazine, um, which uh, represents the interests and views of the over 50s. Um, and uh, Catherine, could I ask you to speak for about five minutes as well? Please? Right. Well, um, I think uh, the ages are changing. And the thing that strikes me that most um, important about all this is that this is the first time, I'm sure, in history where the young actually do know more than the old instead of just thinking they do. <laughs> And as far as I'm concerned, um, it's a quite different pattern of this. I am a pre-boomer in the sense that um, 
we, I came, come from the days when if people, um, my parents, if they wanted to go to college, were in the state, exactly the state the people are in now, i.e. somebody had to pay for it. I was perhaps the lucky one that didn't have to pay for it. But I think all the patterns that people have worked out are changing in the sense that the idea used to be that men retired at sickness and then you cut at the grass for 20 years and then you died. And then that is not in the least what happens anymore. So the question of what happens after you have stopped your main job, and it's, I, my, the burden of my song really is that there is a huge market there which the market is not tackling properly. Um, there is what I call academic background, the emeritus slot. That's to say, when you're doing something that isn't your old job but you haven't retired yet. Um, when Frank Giles was editor of the Sunday Times and he was made ed- editor emeritus, and somebody said, Frank, what does this mean? He said, I don't know, but it means I keep the car. Um, <laughs> and I think um, Ros, or, or, um, who half France, Ros Sago, didn't do very recently, she comes from an um, an investment background and talks about the bonus years where I talk about the emeritus years but it's the same thing that we really are in a state with a completely new element you're not yet an old fogey or if you are you're trying to hide it you're not yet the normal working path and in fact this has got enormous um, potential, potential things both for the people but my contention is that the market hasn't kept up with this um, I mean, Saga has, because Saga sends people on cruises. And the great thing about sending people on cruises is that it's sometimes slightly cheaper than the old folks' home because the doctor is there at the end of the corridor. <laughs> um, um, and um, we have this problem um, that you've got people who feel that they ought to have everything because they're young now, <laughs> and far too much of it seems to hinge on this question of housing and whether they have houses, whether they can afford houses. Well, I have to say, I don't think it used to do. In the, when Keith Waterhouse was writing about the working class and so on, and peop, people would say, well, I've got rights in this house, and Papa would say, you are, you are wrong. Look at the rent book. There was no question of actually owning the house. And uh, I was mildly involved in this myself because... Uh, I was on the board of Nationwide for a bit, and the great thing was, of course, everybody wanted to own their house. And somebody pro- went out and diligently found, tried to find out, found that, in fact, on the more prosperous countries in Europe, uh, there's far more renting among people who are quite in, um, in a position to buy but choose not to. And so somebody said, well, which is... Uh, let's find out which is the... the country in the world that actually has the most owner occupant and we do but we didn't publish it because the answer is Bangladesh so that does mean a slightly different picture that the idea of you haven't grown up you've got your house I think is extremely limiting anyway and people of my antique generation I mean I go my filling my role as this sort of token <laughs> clone uh, um, didn't necessarily think that everything ought to be determined in having a house, starting a family. There were other ways you could make your mark. And there are a whole lot of people floating around now who are well over retiring age, still doing something that's fun, they're still alive, and I would like to find the fact that we're at this conference to say that the market isn't taking them seriously enough. I mean, for example, um, the... Well, the best one, Barry Cry actually had the best idea. He said, what you want was a high speed uh, st- uh, up the stairs thing, which would move, move at great speed, so that it got you up there before you'd forgotten why you wanted to go. Um, and the, th- the great thing, the enormous trade in ways of getting out of the bath, it's, it's good, but it could be a hell of a lot better. And this is because I think people have not realised that the old are just as different as any other section. And that uh, there's a great deal to be got out of them, but you have to work out that they're not all 
to be worked under the same label. And I would like to see economists realising that these people, whether we are guilty of having stolen our young's money or not, um, I think, you know, they may think we're a lot of old cows who ought to not have, but we could be cash cows if only you milked us better. And I think... (laughs) Thank you, Catherine. That was wonderfully timed. Um, <laughs> and next, um, our next speaker is Bonnie Greer, who, um, as I mentioned before, describes herself as a grade A baby boomer. And the way she defines this is the fact that she remembers where she was when JFK was shot. Um, That's the boomer question. The boomer question, exactly. And um, Bonnie um, is a, a writer and is also now the Chancellor of Kingston University. And um, over to you, Bonnie. Um, let me just use my five minutes to say that uh, that that is the you know the boomer question. If you can remember where you were when Kennedy was shot, you are a baby boomer, um, and I do. I was at school, so I know. Um, let me just also um, to say that I, that Ed uh, Sheev's uh, co-author is a good friend of mine. He is more on the right than Sheev, and Ed and I always go toe to toe on this. So it's it's good to meet the other half of this writing duo. (laughs) And I'm also happy to say that, happy to hear that Sheev said he wrote this three years ago, because I think we need to move on. And um, I just want to read something that I found uh, very quickly, and it says everything that I want to say. And it's called Intergenerational Theft, What the Fuck? And it's (laughs) written by a baby boomer, Jill Ovens. By, By the way, I have been more on millennial and Gen Y and Gen Xers side in this argument because those are those are you know I'm I'm proud to say mainly my friends mainly that's true because my husband and I are not parents so we live in a kind of strange little universe where we're not parents we're not grandparents so we're sort of in this place where I know and as a consequence I know people who are friends of mine who are two and three generations younger than me so mainly I was taking their side of the argument because I. I saw how they were living, and I am, of course, with the younger generation, because if you aren't, that's really a stupid place to be. But um, at the same time, becoming chancellor of this university, I've gotten to meet people my age who've had a more traditional trajectory. Uh, their parents were 20 year old, 20 people in their 20s, some people in their 30s, and some of them are grandparents. So this is a woman who is a um, um, has a... A 20 something year old person, and she's about my age. It's called Intergeneral Theft, What the Fuck? Quote If we got divorced, and talking about boomers, if we got divorced, as many of us did, any equity we had in our house was divided up. And when our kids came out of high school in the 1990s, there were no jobs, so they stayed home, along with their girlfriends and eventually their kids. Because our kids can't afford to buy houses, we bought houses for them to live in using the equity from our house, and now all our money is tied up in mortgages. At the same time, we're supporting our parents in their old age. That's how life is and always has been for most of us boomers. Our parents worked to give us a decent start in life, and we worked hard so our kids could have a fair go. We're looking after our parents now in their old age, and we hope we get looked after in our old age. So what the hell is this intergenerational theft? Now, this is what I want to say. I can add that my boomer friends who have kids are talking about their uni grads coming home, back home to the, to the old bedroom because they have no jobs. And uh, before that, my friends at an age when we were brought up to think You can chill out now and do the cruise. I mean, that thing on ITV about people in my generation mainlining Viagra and sailing up and down the Nordic Seas drinking champagne is rubbish because most people aren't doing that. So that, um, so 
people in my generation, in my neighborhood, I live in the West End, are buying flats trying to compete with uh, people from abroad with flats in the West End so they can buy flats for their kids so they can have somewhere to live while they're at university and praying to whatever God they believe in that they can sell these monsters after these kids graduate. Uh, they loan their 20 and 30-something, my generation loan their 20 and 30-something kids. And, and, and with, with pleasure, we loan our kids money that we know we ain't never going to see. Okay? We're paying their tuition. We're taking care of their babies. We're taking care of our mommies and daddies. And we're lucky that we have our mothers and fathers, but they're 80 years old. And sometimes there are health issues where if you're in your 50s and 60s, you're taking care of your son's kids. You are actually going to a schoolyard at 50 and 60 years old to pick up a five and six year old. And then you're getting in your car, rushing up to make sure that your 80 year old mother who refused to leave the home that she's lived in doesn't go walking out at night uh, on her own. That's what being a boomer is. We were told to save our money, and we have, but because of low interest rate, we might as well take our money out of the bank and put it under the mattress because it ain't earning anything. So that is our lot. And I think this idea of jilted needs to be rejigged so that we can see that a lot of us have been jilted. And we need to, instead of coming into an intergenerational war, we need to look at the way the system has been stacked up Hmm. to deprive all of us of not only what we believed we were supposed to have, but also doesn't allow our children a chance to be able to have jobs and housing and a life and deprives us, if this is supposedly the capitalist system, deprives us of the, of the savings and the benefit of the savings that we were told we were supposed to have, and at the same time destroys a system in which our moms and dads cannot get the adequate health care that when they were our age, they thought they were going to get. So this is the battle that these, our generations need to come together and analyze the picture instead of talking about intergenerational theft, because I think it's a waste of time. That's exactly right. Thank you, Bunny. Um, and finally, uh, I'd like to introduce um, Owen Jones, as if I need to, because um, he's on the telly a lot. Um, <laughs> Owen Jones is... Um, as well as being on the telly a lot, um, is uh, columnist. <laughs> <laughs> is um, columnist for the Independent. He writes an excellent column for the Independent, and is the sole member of our panel who is under the age of thirty, um, and so presumably is even more than Shiv truly a member of the Jilted Generation. And so let's find out what he thinks about that concept. I should clarify, I'm under thirty, but I'm over twelve, which might surprise some of you. <laughs> um, now. We're in the midst of the longest economic crisis since Queen Victoria sat on the throne of this country in the 1870s. But it's a crisis that interrupts people's lives in very different ways. At one end, we have half a million people who've been driven into the arms of one of Britain's only booming industries, the food bank. This is the seventh richest country on the face of the earth, and apparently we can no longer afford to feed our poorest people. On the other end, we have the Sunday Times Rich List, the top 1,000 wealthiest people in Britain, they're just the increase in their wealth since Lehman Brothers came crashing down. Just the increase is bigger than the entire annual deficit of this country. Now, it is, of course, my argument that class is the most important division in society. And the way I understand class, it's who has wealth and power and who does not. That doesn't mean it ignores any other divisions, uh, in fact, quite the opposite. It has to integrate them and take gender, for example. It has to understand, if you understand class division, the fact that women are disproportionately concentrated in the lowest paid and most insecure work. And it also doesn't mean airbrushing out of existence. Well, again, the opposite, issues which transcend class, like domestic violence or rape, for example. Nonetheless, without understanding who has wealth and power in society and who does not, it's impossible to understand how society is structured. 
Now, of course, I don't buy this concept, as you probably guess, of the generations uh, or the jilted generation in that sense. I find it troublesome and, in all brutal honesty, potentially quite a dangerous concept. Now, there were some elderly people who are millionaires who thrived in, because of the Thatcherite 1980s. There were other elderly people who are going to freeze to death this winter because they can't afford to pay their energy bills. You have elderly people in this country. If you're elderly, you're more likely to live in poverty even now than the rest of the population. There are those in the, in the 70s and 80s whose lives were trashed as traditional industries vanished. This imp- impossible to homogenise, of course, this generation. And similarly with young people today, you have the child of a millionaire who will be sent to a private school and you have a child born in an ex-industrial community <coughs> who will face little prospect of secure work, who faces the odds stacked against them literally from conception. They will be born with a lower birth weight. Their vocabulary will be uh, 18 months, at the age of five, 18 months behind that of a child from an affluent background. They will have worse housing. They will have a worse diet. All the odds stacked against them. And yet, in contrast, a privileged young person will have parents who can afford to pay for their rent, their mortgage, who can afford to help support them as they get an unpaid internship, which is one of the only ways often to even get the foot in the door of professions which are becoming closed shops for the most privileged people in society. And this is the point. You can generalise about rich and powerful people and say they are rich and they are powerful. You can generalise about people living in poverty and say they are people who all live in poverty. You cannot generalise about the generations. They are made up of very different people, often people with very conflicting (coughs) and contradictory interests. Now, it's often said, it's a cliché now, the next generation will be poorer than the last for for the first time in over a century. Of course, that's absolutely true in the main for working-class children and for a large swathe of middle-class children as well. But that's not the truth for others who will enjoy living standards and comfort which are unprecedented in the history of humanity. And this is why I fear this whole concept, regardless of, and Shiv says, it's not about dividing up the generations. But, of course, it's quite easy for that to be the logical implications of what is set out. And this is why, I, this is why it, it scares me. Because we have a government at the moment... <coughs> which is intentionally trying to redirect people's entirely justifiable anger at their ever-falling living standards, away from those who caused this mess, who plunged this country into the disaster it currently faces, away from them to people's neighbours down the streets. They say to the low-paid worker that your wages are being cut, that they're being cut by the boss, their tax credit slashed by the government, and they say to them, resent your unemployed skyver neighbour next door. They say to the private sector worker where pensions have been decimated. Don't be angry with your boss. Be angry with the nurse next door whose pension is still intact. They say to people living here already, envy the immigrant who has luxurious conditions you could only dream of, false lies and so on and so forth. But that, of course, is the rhetoric, the mantra of this entire government as it tries to redirect anger, to say to people, you've been mugged and therefore your less deserving neighbour should be mugged as well. The last thing we need to be doing now is adding yet another potential division to that. To quote Warren Buffett, a multi-billionaire American, there is a class war and it's my side who is winning. He's absolutely right. It is those at the top versus the rest of us. And what we need to do, whether you're a low-paid worker or unemployed, you're in the private sector or public sector, you're an elderly person who's struggling to choose between heating your home or feeding yourself, or you're a young person facing a future of debt and insecure work, of zero-hour contracts and workfare and all the rest of it, you are all, to coin a phrase, in this together. And we have to link those people together to unite them in, as one, if you like, having the same shared interests and to make the point that all of those people are being made to pay for a crisis they had nothing to do with. It's not young versus old. It's those at the top versus the rest of us. And any other argument which suggests otherwise, I think, is very dangerous indeed.
thank you. Uh, thank you to the panel for, um, for really strongly defined and uh, idiosyncratic and um, really provocative um, perspectives on this uh, subject. Um, I think listening to uh, those, four, uh, those four descriptions of, of, of what, what they believe is, is meant by intergenerational economics and, uh, and, and, and how they feel about that subject. I think what it, it seems to me is it comes down to um, essentially a, a long-term failure of political will. And that, that's one of the things that, that's analysed and described very well in Ed and Shiv's book. Um, you know, Owen says it's a dangerous concept. Bonnie says it's a WTF concept. Um, and Catherine says that... Um, Essentially, although th there has apparently been a massive, uh, or, or evidently been a, a massive transfer of wealth uh, from the young to the old, um, proportionately over the last 35 years, there are still uh, unmet needs and, and unaddressed issues um, facing the older generation. So when it comes down to it, are we all being set up to be squeezed by a system which essentially is creating a new plutocracy? Um, is it another form of divide and rule to set uh, the generations against each other? Um, so what I want to ask the panel um, in turn, I guess, is whether we can look at this as purely an economic, pro uh, purely an economic problem or are there issues of, of social and cultural capital that we also need to address in the sense that uh, certainly... Uh, for the last two generations or so, or certainly since 1979, uh, voters have been quite nakedly, I think, sort of being asked to sort of collude uh, in in the collude in the, in the kind of the hoarding of their assets and to be very very self interested and to uh, go out to kind of hoard the benefits that they uh, have accrued during the post war settlement and and to try and sort of um, pass yeah. them on to the next generation? Or um, uh, is, it, is it a sense that we sort of get the politicians we deserve or have they just led us down a very, very poor quality path, shall we say? So, okay, the question is then, I guess, maybe who do, who do we blame in this book? Um, if we're not blaming... We dedicate it to our parents, by the way. <laughs> so uh, I thought that was a good start um uh, but it's all been downhill since then really and everyone thinks as bonnie has said you you think that 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 your parents have stolen your wealth and that actually came from david willett who's subtitled the book it was book, title of the book was the pinch mm. um uh, and how the boomers have stolen their children's wealth that's not our argument it mm. sounds the same but it really isn't mm. and it's worth in a sense reading the book to find out who we blame. And well, I'll tell you now, and save you the cover price, perhaps. Um, which is to say that we blame the system. Rather like Owen does, blaming the rich, we also blame those same people, uh, the rich and the powerful, um, for impoverishing not just people now, but people in the future, too. Right? This is a time question, right? So you can, like, we all know you can borrow against a credit card on the never-never and sort of pay, pay things off in that way. So, in a sense the living standards of a generation have also been maintained because politicians are quite worried about the people who vote for them now, but they care very little about the people who might vote for them in the future because they're not around to vote, right? So that's how, in a sense, that's a very brief description of how this mechanism has worked. And it's come to be visited upon the youngest adults. It's the same, and, and so when Owen talks about, oh, yeah, but the rich children will be fine. They're not rich, it's just their parents are rich, and, and we're back to old-style 1920s, in a sense. They're class. rich, Steve. They're well, rich. No, no, no. Wait, let me, well, let me finish it. Oh, Owen pointed out the mechanism. He said, oh, yes, but their parents will support them through unpaid internships. As they always have. Indeed. You're right. There's nothing new about this. Let me finish. They'll support them to get a house. You're right. And, Bonnie, you support your kids. You're rich, and you're able to do that. That's great. Now, the question is, is the, the point is, is that those things have become more and more pertinent to succeeding in life than ever before. In a sense that you have to do an unpaid internship to get ahead. You didn't have to do that 10 or 15 years ago, right? You have to be able to borrow large and vast sums of quantities to be able to move out and buy your own home. You didn't have to do that she, before. The, and that's statistically true. So the question is then, why is that happening? And the answer is, is that we haven't invested 
in our future. And the reason is, is because politicians have laid out a chart over the, over the last 30 years, and it's called neoliberalism, and Owen knows it well, right? And the, one of the main things it asks us to do is to treat us like individuals who will be, in a sense, self-satisfied with uh, lower taxes and all those other things. And in that process, as I said, we haven't invested in our future. We haven't built enough homes. So homes are cheaper. Homes, everyone knows if you have more of something, it'll be cheaper. Well, it's the same true of homes. We haven't invested in job training. Mm. So it's harder mm. to get into work. All those things have now been visited upon us. Uh, but, I mean, let, let, let's get a, you know, I don't disagree with the sheep. Let's get a bigger picture. And I can only talk about the United Kingdom. The United States is a little bit different. But in the United Kingdom, there's been a battle since probably the 60s on the size of the state. That This is an ideological battle. Now, it's couched in all kinds of language and, and, and economic uh, folder role, but basically it's about the, the, uh, an ideological battle economically. If you've got a government, and this particular government has spent three times as much money, I think at least three times as much money, in the years that it's been in power, in all the th other years that labor was in power for 13 years, you have to sit back, I mean, logically to ask, why is that? And the reason is, is because the government is rearranging the state. Now, that's the issue at, at, the, at the end of the day. The, one of the things that Owen brought up, which, which again, this is true in the United States, there are people in Owen's generation who are heirs to two and three trillion dollars. Now, no generation has ever had this much money ever in human history. These people are worth it. A handful of people, relatively speaking. So, you know, the idea of a generation being, you know, starved is, is, is an interesting one. I think I have to go, you know, back to what, what Owen has said. This talk about intergenerational whatever battle is a manufactured one. The biggest one is a battle about the state. It's happening in the United States. It's happening here now, nakedly. How is, how are we going to live? Are we going to live in a welfare state, i.e. a state that takes care of basic needs for human beings? And or are we going to live in a state in which there's a lot of risk, in which people are uh, uh, allowed to sort of, you know, basically go for it? This country, the banks, the banks in this country and the United States are cash rich. They have trillions of dollars offshore. If they wanted to invest, the government has begged them to invest in small businesses and infrastructure. They refuse. Why? Because they don't trust what's going on with the government. Meanwhile, that's why we're suffering. It's not complicated. It's, very, it's, it's not complicated at all. So it goes down to what the banks have decided, because most of us have our relationships with banks, uh, borrowing money for our businesses or, or, uh, or, or uh, paying for our homes. They've cut off the spigot because they're businesses, because they're big businesses. And this country has invested in that kind of business model uh, since new labor, frankly so. Well, yeah, so in terms of one thing we do agree on is neoliberalism, so that's a good start. We'll yeah. try and work on that. But the things you're talking about are just not new. I mean, they're as old as, I mean, they go back centuries. I mean, f firstly, the point you make about governments making short-term decisions which aren't taking into account future generations, well, I mean, I'm not sure any government has ever done anything else. The, the point you make about the next generation or wealthy young people being dependent on the wealth of their parents, that, again, has always been the way. Inheritance is the cornerstone of that class system, the transference of wealth and power from one generation to another. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to get some sympathy for these poor, rich, young people who are dependent on the huge wealth of their parents, but I'm struggling. And the point I'm making is, actually, these people have never had it so good because yeah, right. taxes have been slashed on their rich parents, which means they will have access to far greater amounts of wealth than their ancestors could have done, including their parents. But the point you make as well about unpaid internships, I mean, you make the point kind of, 
well, you know, look, this affects everybody regardless of their background. It used to be the case that you didn't have to work for free in order to get your, the foot in the door. Yeah. But the point about unpaid internships is they benefit wealthy young people. Yeah. If you abolish yeah, yeah. unpaid internships, then you would have to hire people or be more likely to hire them on the basis of their ability, not on, their, on the basis of how long can they afford to live on the bank of mum and dad, uh, in one of the most, especially in London, one of the most expensive cities on the face of the earth. What unpaid internships allow is wealthy young people to capture entire professions like the media, where according to the Sutton Trust, over half of the top 100 journalists are privately educated, where only just over one in ten went to a comp. How can an aspiring working-class journalist ever dream of, of getting their foot in the door of the media if they have to work for free and not be guaranteed anything at the end of it? So, and again, the, the emphasis on expensive qualifications in order to do that. So the point is, that is bad, that's it set up, for a working-class young person or for a modest middle-class person. It is very, very good indeed for a child or a young person from a privileged background. Yeah. And therein is the point. It's class, not generation, that is the issue. No. These rich young people are not suffering... They have never, ever, ever, ever had it so good as they have it today. So let me just put it this way, um, which is to say, that you're right. You're exactly right, right? But imagine... Well, there we go, we can end the debate. Fine. Yeah, right. Can I... Should, can I <laughs> yeah. Can I... Uh, b- before you continue, yeah, unless sorry. you'd like to do yeah, very, very quickly, yeah, I'd just yeah. like to bring uh, Catherine... Well, I just want to say, I don't disagree with what you say, but I think we're leaving something else out of this, which is the change in the whole expectation of what the family is going to do for you, which goes right down all the classes. There used to be... I don't know if anybody remembers um, when there was... um, one particular strike was brought to an end, I suppose it was in Thatcher times, by saying, um, will, will you accept that you need a far smaller workforce if you get this money. And the unions were saying, what are you going to do when your son comes to you and says, where's my job, Dad? And you say, I sold your job. But the assumption was that the fathers would give the jobs on and so on. And that, um, and in the saga business, the whole business of what happens to the old and who, if anybody, actually empties the jerry and wipes the nose... It used to be, obviously, the job of the family, and it now isn't. And that was fine when everybody accepted that the state was doing enough. Now, nobody's quite clear that even the state can cope with the elderly as we now are. And I don't think you can discuss this entirely in terms of academics, and those are the trivial, and those are the poor. It's a question of what structures you expect to take care of what. Um, Well, I was just going to come back to... So Owen and I have been discussing this on Twitter, and Twitter's, you know, with its 140 characters, usually the worst place to discuss anything sensible. Um, So um, we always end up kind of... you know, We we know we're on the same side, but we still haven't kind of found our loving middle ground uh, yet. And it's been a number of years, so I'm hoping maybe tonight would be the night. Um, We're almost getting there. Um, Look, Owen, you're exactly right, right? And Bonnie, by the way, is, I think... I would suggest, simply complaining about my issue from her generation rather than complaining about a different issue per se. Um, what does I, that mean, she? Well, you're just annoyed about the kippers, the kids in parents' pockets eroding their savings. I'm not and, annoyed and the about... Boomerang kid. I'm not annoyed about anything. I'd be annoyed if I'm I was... Not, I wouldn't I'm want not. my kid to come back and no, live I'm not. I'm not annoyed at all. I don't have a child, so I don't have any annoyance about ah. one coming back to my house. Ah, well... There's no annoyance okay. in, my, in all right. my life at all. Well, I'm sure you're annoyed for your generation, as Not at way. all. Well, you should be. Um, <laughs> Owen. You can do your Owen, so... Uh, yeah. Owen, Owen says this, right? <laughs> You're exactly right. So you realise that unpaid internships is a problem. That's what I campaign against them, and we actually managed to succeed in getting HMRC to crack down on them. And actually, the culture is changing. This is a good thing, right? Is it not? Because suddenly, the, the, the playing field is levelled in a peculiar way. Suddenly, that doesn't give rich parents that advantage. So, what are the other advantages that rich parents can give their kids that we could take away, right? So, or let me just put it the other way, which is that all these issues are visited upon a certain cohort. Older people don't have to do unpaid internships. Um, older people don't have an issue with Who housing. Who are older Ooh. people? Anyone over 45. But, okay, right. right. But, don't they, I, wait, let me, let, me, let me just finish this through thought, right? Older people generally don't have a, an issue with, and I'm going to say this contentiously, well, A, non-contentiously with student fees. They don't have that issue. 
and with, in a sense, pensions. pensions what do you mean younger. they don't have an issue with student fees? Well, as in they don't directly, aren't liable for the loan that younger people have to pay. Well, how come they pay them? They're paying for them? Not no, the li- well, they shouldn't be. Their, oh, you mean it doesn't come off their back? Right, exactly. Okay. It right. comes off my wages, not my mother's wages. Um, so let me, let, me, let me explain then the last final bit, which is that if you wanted to increase social mobility, if you wanted to improve your issue there, which is my issue too, right, then you'd say, okay, well, let's make sure that young people don't have to do unpaid internships. Let's make sure that housing is cheap so that rich people don't have this advantage to pass on to their kids. Let's remove that advantage. Let's remove that advantage about student fees so kids who graduate and have rich parents have no fees and no debts to pay off, whereas the poorer ones always do. Let's let's get rid of that, right? And then suddenly you end up with a cohort who are a lot freer to do that. And, yes, they will have rich parents. They will have rich parents, and but, have. But, but those particular, quite, particular sorry, advantages I... won't be there for them anymore. Doesn't that seem to make sense to an audience? I don't That's know. I'm, I'm confused okay. as to why it wouldn't. It. Um, yeah, I'm gonna, but how? I'm going to bring this ah. out to the whole audience in a couple of minutes, but I just want to bring in the issue of housing, because housing has been um, uh, an enormous um, engine of uh, the transfer of, of, of wealth, or paper wealth at least, and assets... Um, from uh, to, to an older generation that has benefited from apparently endless house price rises and from uh, the uh, right to buy um, council housing um, over the last 35 years and the notion of the property owning democracy. Now, Catherine um, rightly pointed out that uh, there is no shame involved in private renting in. Um, uh, most European countries, um, and that it's often higher income people who are more likely to rent in um, uh, and to choose to do so um, on the continent. Um, and uh, Bonnie, uh, who pointed out that um, older couples who get divorced then share the equity and have transferred it onto their children in order to help them to, to buy houses. Um, uh, but uh, one thing I want to sort of bring into this, this idea is the notion of. Um, Again, quite quite contentiously, the notion of voter collusion. Now, would any of you argue or accept that um, voters have colluded um, in what politicians have said, which is that your house can be a cash cow, your, the value of your house will go up forever, you don't have to rent, everybody can own, and um, we no, we're not going to ask you to, until there's an absolute crisis in housing, we're not going to ask you to demand that there's a, a regular supply of new housing provided. Um, has anybody got thoughts on that? You know, I, I, I uh, first of all, Shiva, I actually resent you saying that everything that I'm saying is basically based on annoyance, because that's rubbish, number one. Uh, that is a really like demeaning statement, uh, because uh, it doesn't take on board what real people are going through, as opposed to demographics, numbers, and whatever graphs you and Ed were playing with when you did this book. So, don't you know? That's don't do that. Who make Hang graphs. off. Don't. No, it's not. No, but don't do that. It's very important because you won't be sure. able to talk to the people who need to hear what you have to say. Okay, so just take that out of your. If I can say it as an older person, take that out of your vocab. Okay. The other thing um, with housing is. My husband, who is English, and uh, who bought his house in the recession of the 1970s when he was about, he was in his late 20s, he bought the house because he was brought up to believe that that house was going to be something that would help, would he be able to have for his old age. It was a play, It was something that he could borrow against, which is what he did. He was able to do certain things within this, Catherine says, as well, <laughs> Uh, having a house took you to another class. And it's true in the United States. Your house, that is the biggest source of wealth for most people, is your property. So, And we are, as Americans are, a bricks-and-mortar people. The French aren't like that. The Germans aren't like that. But Americans and the British are very much, we, we love our bricks-and-mortar. We love our house and garden. That's just the way we are. So... Margaret Thatcher, one of the things I think that she did, which was fascinating to me, was that she said to people, basically, you can own your own house. I want you to own your own house. I think that that was a really big psychological shift for a lot of people. So it isn't a myth 
to say that people, it, people didn't collude. That for ordinary people, for most of us, that's our wealth. That is what that is our wealth. That is what we were able to pass on to our children, is what we were able to do things with. And then suddenly, when you have to sell a house in order to take care of your parents because they need you to help them, they're 85 and 86 years old, or you need to help your children, you're doing that at 50 and 60, that's a huge, 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 huge trauma. And I think that kind of shakeup isn't dealt with enough in, in the discussion that we're having. It's very important. And I think that, that Owen's generation, which would be interesting, is going to be probably more like a European, like a French generation, in the sense that you guys aren't going to be used to owning anything. It's just going to be understanding about rental and not having, as my generation was brought up, to believe that having a house was everything. Well, um, but Catherine, oh, sorry. No, uh, go on, no, just... Go on. Um, Catherine, uh, I was interested in this idea of the, the bonus years that you had. And, and it really, you talking about the sort of... Uh, Bonnie was just saying that, 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 you know, people in their 60s are, in some cases, selling their houses in order to help out for the care of 85- and 86-year-old parents. Now, these are not just bonus years, but bonus decades. People are living, well, uh, incre- uh, you know, 20 years longer yeah. than they did a couple of generations yeah. ago. And is that, is that what you mean by bonus no, years? I, no, I wasn't so much talking about what they had to do to, to keep going their um, not-yet-successful children or their even more aged parents, but the fact that there was a gap, and it is an interesting one, between the end of your OK career bit and when you were finally going to be hauled into the old folks' home. And a lot of people talk as if there was nothing but the workers and the people who were, in one way or another, completely failing. And it's not true. And I'm very interested in what you can do with that bit. And the WVS, in the days when it was still WVS, before they took the W away because it stopped the men volunteering, um, it's now the RVS. But they did a thing called the gold thing of partly listing all the people who were technically old, who were you never think of as old, like Delia or Ralph Fiennes or something like that. And um, the idea that the old are a drag on everybody else is, can be countered. That if given the right chances, they are not necessarily something that their poor old children have to carry around their shoulders. They are actually coping for themselves in a longer life. And I think once having this conversation is not just how the old do or don't do the right thing by their kids. It's how the old, if they're going to live a lot longer, actually manage to do it independently and cheerfully. Mm-hmm. And this is where I come back to my own particular hobby horse, which is that everybody who is working successfully now it ca- is absolutely master of all the technology. And this is extremely difficult for an awful lot of older workers to cope with, including me. Uh, that there's this whole way of doing things which the untrained older person isn't going to know how to use. Now, OK, if we're worried that the old aren't taking care of their youngsters, then we don't need to bother about this. But if you're worried that the young are being burdened by their parents because the parents can't do it without the boys coming around to fix the computer three times a week, which is just as much of a common problem. Believe me. <laughs> if I could hardly work at all if I didn't have a son within reach. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I think we've got things going on at a pretty... Uh cracking pace there but uh, I'd like to uh, open it out to the floor now and uh, find out if anybody would like to um, ask questions of each of our panellists or all together um, or simply comment on what we've talked about so far uh, we've, got, we've got 15 minutes roughly for questions and answers um, does somebody have a microphone yes okay then um, I think it's probably best to take questions in pairs and then I'll okay so um, can we take uh, the man at the back and the man holding the, uh, yeah, waving the brochure, please, first? Thank you. Uh, basically, I'm a great believer in contributing to the common 
Commonwealth of, of a country. Uh, my own case was that I wasn't born in London, all the families, but lots of the families were born, you know, been for a long time in London. <laughs> I can assure them the housing situation of them and the class situation is totally different from where I'm from, which is in Birkenhead, one yeah. of the poorest places in the UK. And my husband's from Birkenhead, I know Birkenhead extremely so, well. Yeah. So basically, one of the poorest places in the UK. Yeah, I'm absolutely. Sure I was 15 and I'm 70 now. I paid contributions, a tax, and a national insurance. Right? And I'm getting older. What I thought was going to be there for me ain't there anymore. That's right, that's the right. health service has capitalist damage. And basically, right. you'll, only, you'll only deliver what you can make money out of. There's no interest in anything else. So basically, that's my reward for paying all these decades. Contrast that with my nephews. My nephews have not contributed anything. No taxes, no insurance, nothing. It's not their fault, because basically, in recent decades, they've not got enough opportunity. They've had the opportunity with the dog, they've had the opportunity of fighting the army, and they've had the opportunity with prayer promoted of going to uni and getting a big, big debt. <laughs> so basically, it's not the only generation's fault. No, no, no. And just one last thing. Owen and Bonnie have made val valuable contributions on the BBC. The BBC tonight is dividing the, uh, the old for the young by having two lots of question times. Why they're doing that, I don't know. I belong, but I've got my doubts about the genuineness. I belong to the National Con um, Pensions Convention with two and a half thousand supporters and members. We've been lobbying the BBC for, for five, ten years about how about having an older person on the panel on the Thursday night for any questions. The BBC and the people who make the programme won't entertain them. They keep on saying older people won't be able to call for the lights and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> <laughs> when did you last see, only celebrity ones can do that, like John Baker. But yeah. when did you last see a working class older people making a case out for old people? Well, on, on the BBC, you don't see them. And it's part of the policy of divide and rule. Because it's a conspiracy going on somewhere here. Yeah? It's trying to actually rip off antagonism between the, the, the old and the young. The best thing both the old and the young can do now is join the campaign against fuel poverty, which is affecting students in bed seats and old people are can't afford to put the heat in. I think that does partly go back to what Owen was saying because when did you last see any working class person on TV, never mind a working class older person, but, but maybe we'll talk about that um, when after we've heard the second question. Well, I can tell you why. I, I would throw out very briefly the question of whether we're perhaps being very parochial in this. Uh, and if you were talking about young Chinese, they wouldn't be feeling jilted at all. Uh, and yes, overall, if people are talking about getting poorer... Yes, there are people, old people getting poorer, younger people getting poorer. The whole society is getting poorer because there are other bits of the world that have been poor for a long time that are coming up. Just a thought. Um, so, should we go back to the, the, the first, uh, the first respondent's um, question? Um, now, that brings quite to the fore a sort of. Um, I hate to use this term, but intersection, uh, a, a, a meeting point, I'd rather say, a meeting point of, of, of class and generation. Um, Owen, would you like to... Well, I mean, that's the key, that's that the first. absolute fundamental point, because you can't, as I say, you can't generalise about generations. Generations are made up of multimillionaire pe business people who, who thrived because of neoliberalism, and it, and it includes elderly people who are going to be freezing, in some cases, tragically to death this winter. I, I'm glad you brought the National Pensioners Convention. I spoke at your conference, National Pensioners Convention, earlier this year, and I made that call for unity. And I think the call based on fuel poverty is, is a great rallying call. Nine million people are going to be driven into fuel poverty by 2016. That includes elderly people, who, as I say, are more likely to live in poverty generally than the rest of the population. And it includes young people like students. And I think that's one key example of how we can build solidarity based on not on what age bracket you happen to fall into, but the circumstances uh, in which you actually live. And I think what is a scandal, you talk about paying into the system. I mean, this is the other point. When we talk about 
the baby boomer generation or whatever, we're talking about people who've paid into the system all their lives, who built this country. Many of the things my generation take for granted, which are now being shredded by this government and its predecessors, were given to us, bequeathed to us by generations before us who fought often with great sacrifice in order to win those things. What an absolute disgrace, then, that many of those people are now struggling to even heat their own homes or even feed themselves. Where we have, if we're going to broaden it out, local care services being slashed by local authorities right across the country. Who's that hammering? It's hammering elderly people. Just one example of how the austerity programme at the moment is hitting the older generation. And that's the point. We've got to look at this on the basis of who has wealth and power and who does not. And it all comes down, as I keep saying, to those at the top who won't pay their taxes, whose wealth is booming like it's never boomed, who are enjoying taxes being slashed on them, while everybody else is facing the longest fall in living standards for over 100 years, where taxes such as VAT have been hiked on them, where benefits have been slashed for them right across the board. As I keep saying, we've got to keep remembering it's everybody against the people at the top and we've got to start finding ways of uniting people, like you say, on the basis of class, on the basis of whether you're young or old. If you're struggling, we're all in this together and we've got to find a way of bringing those people together and not being divided and not letting anyone divide us. Can, can I say also that, you know... Sorry. You know, first of all, question time is what they call in America infotainment. So, you know, you, you don't really seriously look at question time to get any kind of light on any kind of subject. Um, no, I'm just being I'm blunt. Sorry. I'm, you know, I'm being blunt about it. I mean, you know, I, I, I seldom look at it. Uh, so, you know, it, it's infotainment. It's like Strictly. Uh, with people sitting down. Um, You're missing Owen then. He's yeah, on there no, all the no, time. No, no, he's not on there all the time. And, and, the, and, the, second, and the second thing is um, there's an expression in America called barefoot, pregnant, and in the kitchen, which usually is applied to women to keep women from understanding, you know, what's going on in the world and blah, blah, blah. And that's what uh, uh, we are being kept in terms of the economic reality of this country. Um, I really, in the last three or four years, because of the economic crash in the States, really taught myself how to uh, look at, read, econ- read, papers, read economic papers, look at the stuff that's going on. We really, as an electorate, because the election is going to be a smoke and mirrors job from basically of the conservative party to make us feel that you know somehow somewhere it ain't us but somebody is benefiting from so called recovering economy there's there's a long long analysis of it it's out there it exists but i think what we all need to do is really make ourselves a lot more aware of what's going on and you start with your own life you see what your own, what's happening in your own life, what's happening in your friends' lives, your family's lives, and then you take the analysis out. It's not, what's going on is not complicated. It's, it's, it's a very simple thing. And it does go back to, I mean, I don't go into the class thing as much as Owen, but it does go back to the fact, and, and, and Warren Buffett, who is a billionaire, stands up and steps up to the plate and says it. Wealth is being concentrated in the hands of fewer and fewer people. This is a fact. And we have to make a decision about that. And the, all of these sort of games and language that's being used to make it sound, to divide us into generations, into ethnicities, into North and South, into different nations, all of that is smoke. It isn't really what it's about, and we need, as a, as a people, to get very clear. This country in particular, this country is what's known as an open economy, which basically whatever happens in the United States happens here. So if the United States is booming, which is starting to pick up because, the, the, uh, because of, of, of quantitative easing, this country is getting some of the, the blowback as well. What's really happening, we don't really get that message. But you know what's happening, because it's happening in your home, it's happening to your neighbors, it's happening with your children, it's happening with your friends. 
that's where we start, and then we make the analysis out from there. So it's been... Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so on the point about China. Yes, I was just In gonna... China, they have the same thing, which is um, they, they call their kids Ken Lao Tzu, uh, the tribe who chew on the old, um, which is the same as our kippers. So they've got the same problem there too, interestingly. Um, it is a, it's a global problem. Uh, it's really, really interesting. And it's brought about by the same economic systems that people uh, engender, which basically pay no heed again to the future um, as, as, as much as they do to the past, which comes back to that point about voter collusion. Can I just talk about housing for one microsecond, which is you know, that stuff about rent is, is rubbish. Um, uh, uh, it, basically, the reasons why people rent in, say, Germany... Uh, is because we have, they have different rental laws. And, and people who are over 45 will remember that we used to have those same rental laws here. So we had rent control. We had fixed tenure. And you couldn't throw people out simply for... If they carried on paying their rent, you couldn't throw them out. Um, if they only had... They had to default, basically. There had to be a good reason to throw someone out of their privately rented home. Those, all those rules changed. I don't know whether you know this. You might not know this because you probably own your own home. Statistically speaking, most of that generation do. So analysis, man. What? Ha- okay. Um, so, so most of them do, so you won't know that the rents, ch- the rental terms change, and actually living in the pre- private rental sector is extremely expensive. There's no more rent control, and it's really insecure. So, if you want to have a kid, I, and this problem is for Bristol and in Bath too, um, in, in these regions, I, I know that my friends here living here find it increasingly difficult to I, purchase a home. So, you, if you live in the private rental sector, it's really difficult to raise a family. People don't want to do it. Um, I, I don't understand Bonnie or Owen at this point. I'm kind of really confused because... And they, so are we, Shiv. Yeah, so, yeah, you, you know, let's just make this mutual yeah, yeah. marriage. No, what's what's even about two seconds. <laughs> uh, I just want to take two more questions um, and then hopefully you can come back and say what you were about to say. Sorry. Um, uh, can we have the microphone, the, the, the man uh, just to my right and the lady two rows in front of her, please? Can I take up this matter of housing, especially just briefly to challenge Chev? When we had the previous housing legislation, there was very little rented housing to let. The new shorthold legislation has resulted in much more housing to let. The problem of rents is lack of housing, and the house prices is lack of housing. The answer to all these problems are build more housing. And we've got to find a way to build hundreds of thousands more houses, not just a few hundred, a few thousand, there are hundreds of thousands. Back in the 50s, we were building 300,000 houses a year. We've got to get back to that, and that will be rented housing and owner-occupied, and then young people will be able to rent houses at a reasonable price and buy houses at a reasonable price. The problem is the older people will not like the drop in house prices, yeah. and that is where there may be some voter collusion. Yeah, that's well, what I was... No, well, you, let, you let councils build housing, you lift the borrowing cap on them, which will What's create jobs, stimulate the economy, stop us spending billions of pounds subsidising these grubby private landlords yeah. who charge rip-off rents and expect you and I, the taxpayer, to step in. It's quite simple. Yeah. And I live, off, I live off Oxford Street... I live off Oxford Street in one of the most expensive, the most expensive council, I think. I live in Westminster. So you're I, the one percent. I, I, listen, let me finish. <laughs> let me tell you something. I live in Westminster, and I rent in Westminster. And let me tell you something. 73% of the housing around me is offered abroad first. We, I, live in a, I live in a community where there are people on the street they do not get that housing. I live near three universities. Those young people, if they're in that housing, their parents have bought that apartment. That's the situation we're in right now. Westminster Council has no interest in actually making housing for poor people, and Camden Council is trying to do it. So it is a matter, it is a matter of, of making rental housing affordable again for people to live in. It is not. 73% of the housing in my neighborhood is offered to China and India and the United States. And that's a fact. Yes. Um, and can I yeah. uh, take the second question? Um, I'm a 1948er and proud to be born in that year, um, <laughs> year of the introduction of the National Health Service. And yeah, I had, and I, like you, Lindsay, grew up in a council house. Um, we were proud to, we were proud. We felt, we, it, it, it felt like a good life 
um, simple, <laughs> but good life, to grow up in a council house, to have free education, to go to college. And since then, I've put my 40 years into the public sector as a teacher. And I, I really believe in that Ken Loach idea, the spirit of 45. We have got to actually embark on council house building, get back to education, free education for all. Mm. They, were, they were things that we fought for. And so when I hear some people having a go at the baby, I say, but... We benefited, but we also fought for it and defended exactly. all those yeah, things exactly. all our your lives. We worked exactly. in no, trade. You exactly. stand on the shoulders of giants. No, exactly. you didn't. We your we your went generation didn't fight for council housing. No, you bought it all sorry. at discount rates. Can I just tell you? Can I just tell you one thing? Most of us didn't, many of us didn't buy mm. and lived in things like housing, but we had a choice. Housing association houses, mm -hmm. council housing. These are the sort of choices I had. And I've been in a trade union all my life and I fought to defend comprehensive and, and state education. So don't tell me that we haven't done our bit because we I'm know that they were the good times. True, yeah. We thought things were getting better. And that's why we defended all these things, the health service. And we continue to defend them. And we want to go forwards defending it. And it was Blair and and Thatcher and those people that actually made property and house buying um, you know, so, so, so wonderful for everyone. A and mania. we know it's not a mania, exactly. And we know it's not because it's turned into our kids not being able to buy places or not having the choices that we had. And so I want to see the spirit of 45 again, where we actually believed in a welfare state that provided for all. And what we've gone backwards. And the divide between rich and poor is so huge. And I tell you, it's much worse now for the 15 to 24 year olds who I read today 14% of them not in any. Think. No, no training, right, no right. employment. The that's 14 right. to 20, 15 right. to 24 years, they are really suffering, and so many of our graduates. And they're being taught so to work for nothing. Exactly. Nothing. Nothing. Bla uh, Cameron did a thing today on volunteerism. He had a whole bunch of kids in his office, and I'm sitting there thinking, why can't they get paid? Exactly. Why are they stand, sitting there in little white T-shirts volunteering to do stuff? Why can't they get paid? Do you paid? know, in our society, there are so many jobs that need doing old people's homes, hospitals, teachers, yeah. in school, and that's colleges. Care service, we, need, exactly. we need people in these jobs, and yet they're being cut, and the rich are getting richer. So we need to actually have a really different idea about what makes a good society. Yeah. Immediately. Wow. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you for that uh, contribution. Um, we, we really yes. have got to. We really have got to wrap up, unfortunately, because we have uh, gone a little bit over time. Um, I just wanted to, to, to add, uh, as chair, I hope you don't mind. Are you just butting a little as, as chair? And talking of free education, Germany, which of course is a country uh, on a par. Uh, in terms of wealth uh, with Britain, uh, one of the wealthiest countries in the world has um, gradually and has now fully abolished all tuition fees for university students. So if they can't do it, why can't we? Uh, that's, one, that's just one step towards making things a little bit more equitable again. Ideological. Um, but um, just to um, sum up uh, in the crudest way possible, I guess, um, Shiv... Um, has any of today's discussion um, <laughs> caused you to um, caused you to uh, make uh, caused you to consider some any of the arguments in your book? Reconsider any mm. of the arguments in your book? Just yes or no? Uh, <laughs> no, like but that. I do feel anointed by being patronised by Bonnie Greer in the most <laughs> lovely way. Um, that was good. And, um, didn't mean to do that. In turn, in turn, Catherine, in turn, Catherine, Bonnie, and Owen. Um, has listening to Shiv um, recap his argument uh, made you agree with it more or agree with it less? Um, do you think the generations are at war? Shiv's, Shiv and Ed's argument is arguably one of the most important out here. And, you know, if we don't engage with it, if we don't understand it, it's to our detriment because this is the present and the future to a certain extent, talking to us. Uh, I'm talking about baby boomers. We need to hear it. We need to engage with it. We need not to be defensive about it because it's coming from a reality. 
a real place. But I think that what I would say, and you know, apologies again, Shiva, I didn't mean to patronize you, absolutely, so I apologize if it came across that way. But I felt you were doing it to me. But if, if you know, but, but, but doing it. yeah, but I didn't, I didn't mean to do that. But I think the argument is extremely important. I think the book is extremely important because the argument is set forth by two intelligent people. But we need to now move that argument on to a fact that we've all been jilted, every last one of us, and we need to look at it in that way. Yeah, okay. Um, I'm sorry, I, I really will have to um, wrap up, but um, uh, I'd just like to uh, uh, commend uh, Shiv's, Shiv's, uh, the word Shiv uses in his book, which is doinked. <laughs> Uh, that was diddled and doinked. Um, uh, I'd like to um, thank everybody on our panel uh, for what's been a really exciting discussion. I think we could have carried on, but I'm being told to stop, unfortunately. Um, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Andrew Kelly, who's the director of this festival, um, who will um, end tonight's session. Uh, but thank you all for attending. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Lindsay, and thank you to all the panel. If you're staying for the next session, you're very welcome to stay here. You don't have to go out and come back in again. As I said at the start, if you'd like to read any more of the panel's books, they're all available in the middle uh, room there, and includes Bonnie's book um, on Obama um, and Owen's Chavs, uh, Catherine Whitehorn's wonderful um, autobiography, as well as the classic Cooking in a Bedsitter, uh, Lindsay's Estates and Shiv's book as well. So if you're coming, if you want to, if you're coming to the next session, you're welcome to stay in here. If you'd like to get books, join the argument. They'll be at the bookshop at the back. Thank you again to the panel and thank you again for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you.